Good evening, this is Game Journalism Network. I'm Aaron Pabone. The SPJ Airplay event hosted by the Society of Professional Journalists Region 3 and SPJ Florida was held on Saturday, August 15th at the Quebec Center in Miami, Florida. Airplay was the first live gaming debate and was organized and moderated by Michael Koretsky, the Region 3 Director of SPJ. The event was divided into two panels, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The morning panel was to explain what Gamergate is and if the gaming press is ethical. The afternoon panel was to discuss how the media should cover online controversies like Gamergate. Nine panelists were brought on to represent various parts and issues in the Gamergate controversy. Representing the pro side during the morning panel was Mark Seb of the Action Points YouTube channel, Ash Snow of the Washington Examiner, and Alon Bukhari of Breitbart.com. Representing the pro side in the afternoon panel was Kathy Young of Reason, Christina Hoff Summers of the American Enterprise Institute, and Miley Yiannopoulos, also of Breitbart.com. The two panelists representing a non-Gamergate side, but also representing journalism, were Lynn Walsh, a journalism ethics expert, and the secretary treasurer of the Society of Professional Journalists, and Ren LaForme, a teacher at Pointer Institute for Media Studies. An additional panelist, Derek Smart, an independent game developer, was representing a neutral side of the Gamergate debate. There were no panelists at SPJ Airplay representing anti-Gamergate. Kresge stated online that he did reach out to members of the anti-Gamergate movement. However, they declined the invitation. The morning panel was considered by many the most civil of panels. Gamergate was explained to a journalist that had no knowledge of Gamergate as a whole, and examples of unethical activity were shown to journalism experts. Here are some moments during the morning panel. Isn't it the job of a publication, though, to impose some level of standards on its writers to make sure that accurate reporting happens? Just to be clear on something, uh, Lynn Walsh and Ren LaForme, what's your opinion of the journalistic value of Gawker? <laughs> I mean, I would never quote them or cite them or, I mean, I... <laughs> it seems mainstream media doesn't, I was, well, I mean, in the case of this airplay, doesn't know how to approach games. So you rely on the game's media to fill your beat. And even though, as you say, it's ridiculous we're talking about Gawker, you rely on them. They're giving you bad information, in the case of the New York Times, they're giving you bad information, and then it's within printing the misinformation, which just makes people even more distrustful of journalists. What so while I'm sorry it is ridiculous, it has to be done, because the information keeps you I mean, it sounds around. like the I was gonna say, it's, I, if, I have a reporter and they want to cover a restaurant or we're doing an investigation on the restaurant's, I don't know, cleanliness. Mm -hmm. If they have any ownership or their friend has any ownership of that restaurant or any connection, they absolutely would not work on that. The moment that had everyone talking was Paulo Munez, aka Game Diviner's response to Ren LaForm about Gawker Media. I know you uh, put Kotaku and uh, ethics uh, in one sentence as a mockery of what a Gawker is, but I want to remind you of one thing. Gawker destroys lives. There's a big reason why many of us in Gamergate are anonymous, because Gawker will destroy people. Take the, take the example of Justine Scavo, I believe her last name is that. Justine Sacco. 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 She was one woman who made one wrong tweet, and the man who destroyed her life, Sam Biddle. And we are facing them. Nick Denton himself has said we have cost him three, seven figures of money on advertising revenue. Do you think any one of us here wants to put our face to that when Gawker is willing to put out hundreds of people's uh, private citizens put out their addresses because they own a gun in New York City. We are scared to put our faces out here and people here who are in Gamergate are putting our faces out here because we believe in this and this is Gawker's power. Gawker is not just unethical. Gawker is willing to destroy private people's lives and by putting my face here I put my family's uh, my family in danger but I'm willing to be here because I believe in gamers. I believe they are good people, and I believe we have been mislabeled this entire time. So please do not dismiss this by saying Gawker should not be, should, shouldn't be unethical. So thank you very much, Mr. LaFord, for being here. Game Journalism Network was at Airplay, where we hosted a pre- and midday Airplay stream. Here's what Paul Munoz had to say about his Gawker statement in our midday stream. Well, I have to admit that uh, Red LaFord actually did make me mad. I... The, uh, the way he was coming across, he was just simply like, he was brushing the side saying, you guys are expecting Gawker to be ethical. <laughs> and just the way he came across, just, I had to stand up and say yeah. to his face why we're so afraid. Why, you know, why it's now dangerous. I mean, we just got docs, as you just said. Yeah. We've been I mean, lots of people have been docs on the chat. It's dangerous. And not to mention the fact that Gawker has a record of this. 
So I, I mean, I had to say it to his face because I wouldn't, I did not want him to mock a year of a struggle. Here are some select moments during the afternoon panel. That was a problem that Gamergate had was the mixing. I am I trying think, to get. I think it's a distraction. I don't think they really care about that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I find it interesting that this is a leaderless movement, but you know how they feel. No, I mean, I've interviewed, what, 200 of them for my book, so I have a reasonable idea of how most of the most active members feel, yeah. What if Ren and Lynn were to do a story on the year anniversary of Gamergate, and the first calls they would make would be to Oliver Campbell, Sargon of Akkad, and these other YouTube streamers? What if that was where they started, and they wanted to ask them about their opinions on Gamergate? Would that be... They'd be doing a damn sight more than CBS, the BBC, any number of other New broadcast Times. networks, right, any number of national be newspapers. Excellent. They'd excellent. be doing a hell of a lot more than any other national broadcast or print media ever bothered to do. I'm not a journalist. I'm just a game developer and a gamer. I was a gamer first before everything else. The issue here is very simple. If the media, if the media wants to report on anything, first of all, I, I just feel bad that these two people are sitting here and they have to answer these questions about something they're not very familiar with, which puts them at a disadvantage. I'm a gamer. Nir knows a lot more about this stuff than I think everybody in this room because he's done a lot of research on it as, uh, as Suzanne and everybody else has done. But the problem here is this. Trying to say you have, you, writing a story is one thing. If there's an oil spill, okay, you can write about an oil spill. You can find who to ask, you can take pictures, you can do all these things. But trying to report on something like Gamergate is it's difficult. Well, that's why we're here, Derek. But here's the thing. Well, hang on. I that I, I understand that. But the, the, you keep asking this this question and putting them on the spot, knowing fully well that it's it's a loaded question and there's no way to answer it without falling afoul of whatever it is you think they should be saying. And it's here's why. Like, uh, which is the reason why? Which is hey, no? Hang on, hang on. Which is the reason why? When this whole thing became Gamergate and it stopped being about somebody's personal affairs, and the, me the, the media found themselves in the, firing, in the firing line, they became the target, the first thing they did was they hit back. Now we have all the- Airplane and Stream were not immune to trolling bomb threats, doxing, and other such issues. Prior to the day of the event, bomb threats were called in, but the Quebec Center was swept and secured. The live chat on the official SPJ live stream was bombarded with swastikas and other hate messages. Panelists and Kretzky himself were even doxed in the live chat. At the beginning of the afternoon panel, Koretsky addressed airplay attendees stating that another bomb threat was called in but ensured the audience that the facility was secure due to precautions made prior. I've been notified there's been a bomb threat. Surprise, surprise. Thanks, Arthur. <laughs> because this is a secure facility, because we took security precautions, we're going to continue. But if anyone in this room wants to leave, um, you can do so, no hassle and no judgments. <laughs> Anyone want to leave? <laughs> However, after an hour and 20 minutes into the second panel, the Quebec Center was evacuated due to another bomb threat sent to the Miami Dade Police Department and the Miami Herald, the local newspaper in Miami, Florida. The claim was that a bomb would go off at 2.45 p.m. at the Quebec Center. The threat was deemed credible by the police, causing the evacuation of not just airplane, but also another SPJ event happening at the Quebec Center and nearby homes surrounding the area. The live stream was cut to a static image of the airplay event banner, but the audio was still streaming. This is not the first bomb threat made to an event related to Gamergate. In May of this year, a bomb threat was sent to the Gamergate meetup in Washington, D.C. At the time of this recording, it is unknown who made the threat aimed at SPJ airplay. Outside, Derek Smart and Game Journalism Network had live streamed on the streets of Miami showing what was happening with the evacuation, but both streams were limited to the battery power of our respective devices. The sweltering heat from the Miami weather also caused discomfort for some, forcing SPJ volunteers to run to a nearby convenience store to purchase water for the evacuees. The SPJ airplay debate, however, continued in front of a condemned house in front of the police. I myself was asked to act as a temporary moderator for the event. At the last minute, Koretsky added Oliver Campbell to the panel team as well. Campbell was originally going to be a panelist, but due to various issues, I chose not to attend as a panelist. He was, however, in attendance as an audience member up until the impromptu outdoor debate. The debate changed from a debate to a question and answer session with airplay attendees. 
Questions asked range from how Gamergate could overcome gaming journalists working in collusion, the Game Journalist Pro List, and how journalists can cover events like Gamergate in the future. A full video of the continued debate can be seen on the Gamers Aren't Dead YouTube channel. The debate continued until the police gave the all clear where attendees retrieved their belongings, and Kretzky was able to officially end airplay. So I want to thank all of you guys that endured the bomb threat and everyone that listened. Um, I've always wanted to say this, uh, never could. Uh, you don't have to stay home, but you can't stay here. Game Journalism Network will continue to cover this as updates occur and have other reports and analysis as well. We will begin covering gaming journalism starting in mid-September with Tokyo Game Show. Thank you for watching Game Journalism Network. I'm Amber Bone. Good night.